people think they're eating a healthy diet uh, when they're having oats and a banana smoothie in the middle of winter in Buffalo, New York. And I said, that that would never, you can never eat that way. You can never source bananas in Buffalo, New York in the middle of winter to make this smorgasbord of, of stuff. It just, but people, you know, they trying, they're trying. That's the thing. They're, it's not people are being careless. They're, people are trying. They've just been told the wrong information. And in that, that's leading slowly, it, it, you know, over time to, to many issues. Jose, how did you find Carnival? Dave, thank you for having me on and uh, allowing me to share my story. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a thing where I was, like many people, forced to become my own doctor. I didn't have any nutritional thing. Mind you, I never came from an area where I was ever had obesity or diabetes. I was always healthy. And I always tried to live a healthy life. I actually studied film. And, you know, everything was fine to a certain degree. I had some minor gut issues throughout my life, but nothing serious, nothing that, you know, impeded my life in any significant way. And then right around my mid-30s in 2019, things kind of came to a head and, and like a brick. My life suddenly after a trip, it was kind of leading up to it, but after a trip, things just kind of started declining rapidly. And, you know, at the time I, I was questioning what was happening. Um, first, depression started setting in and I'd never been a depressive person. Then after the depression, um, the most concerning thing was this urinary frequency that I was starting to urinate something like 20 times a day and I couldn't hold it. It was a, like a frequency and urgency that I was starting to, I tried to ignore it first, but then it came to a point where it was getting just really problematic. And of course, at the time, like most people, I turned to conventional medicine in hopes of getting answers. And this is kind of when the real decline started happening. Cause you know, I went to urologists, I went to different specialists, and they couldn't give me any answers. They say, you're fine. You're, you know, all the blood work. I took out so much blood. It was just crazy. I did every test imaginable and it was kind of starting to increasingly get even worse and worse. And I kept going back to, well, maybe try a different urologist, maybe try someone else. And I went on this merry-go-round for about a year and a half of just trying conventional medicine and getting of course, different diagnostics, you know, some persons, oh, well, you're just stressed. Others is, well, you might need to change your diet. And it's worth noting that I, I didn't come from, you know, eating pizzas and burgers and, and beer or sodas. I was always pretty health conscious. I was doing three years prior to this breaking point, a paleo diet, you know, which I'll circle back on later, you know, full of healthy vegetables and spinach salads and sweet potato and all this stuff. I was eating a Paleolithic style diet and I thought that was healthy. So I said, there's, what can I improve? I mean, but they basically, none of these people gave me any real dietary advice. It was just basically the usual, I'll try this medication, come back in three months, blah, 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 blah. And I got really, really bad. I mean, it, it got to a point where I think my wife that she kept me sane because, you know, I could barely work. I couldn't sleep at night. The insomnia and depression got really, really bad. I went something like, I'm not joking, that year, late that year, six days without sleeping straight. I almost lost my mind. I was getting really, really bad. And luckily she she helped me keep it together and said, look, we got to keep searching. And, you know, so again, I tried the conventional medicine route for about a year and a half. Um, and then they told me I had pudendal nerve, I had a sports hernia, anything you could think of that would explain this. It was They're just throwing diagnostics out there and, oh, go get an MRI and go to get this. Oh, you went to the gym. Oh, you probably uh, had a hernia that you don't even realize. I'm like, I think I would have felt something. No, no, no. And you, at the time, you're so desperate for answers. You believe these things. You, you don't question it and you don't stop to think. And at one point, I, I begged through a, a mutual friend to get to the head urologist of one of the most respected um, hospitals here at Miami. And I said, OK, this guy's going to give me the answers. And I went and saw him and he, I, mean, I told him, look, I'm not sleeping. I'm very depressed and I'm most worrying, urinating like 20, 24 times a day. And I, I can't stop and I don't know what to do. And he looks at me after running all the tests. He says, well, all your blood work, everything's fine. 
you're too young to be stressing about this. Just live your life. I'm like, I'm like, do you think I'm making this up? I'm like, no, no. He's like, I, you're too young. Stress. So what if you have to pee 20, 24 times a day? Pee. I'm like, that's your answer. That's your, the head urologist said this, this is your answer. Just go. That's, that's my life now. So at that point I kind of said, you know, I give up on the um, conventional medicine. And then I went through a whole nother year of a more functional, holistic, naturopathic approach. And that was another about year and a half of that, of trying every supplement, detox, every sort of treatment you can imagine. I mean, my medicine cabinet, it was full of every herb and vitamin and supplement you can imagine. And none of that really, I mean, they, they might have moved the needle a little bit, but they didn't really help. And again, throughout all this, through the conventional and even the naturopathic, no one mentioned diet. No one ever said anything about diet. It was kind of, I mean, even the conventional people were like, oh, stop qu drinking coffee and, you know, avoid acidic foods. That was the extent of this vast nutritional um, scope. And, and in that naturopathic approach, I finally found a doctor who told me, you know, this is stemming from your gut. I'm like, what do you mean my gut? You know, at the time it didn't make sense. I'm like, I, this is my bladder that's bothering me and, and my sleep. You know, what does my gut have to do with this? He's like, well, this is some form of uh, leaky gut that you have, and it's really driving some chronic inflammation in you. And again, at the time I was eating a healthy diet and I said, that, well, I don't know what to clean up anymore. I don't, you know. So, but even that doctor who was kind of more aware didn't mention anything like a strict elimination diet or anything like that. He just kind of left me to my own devices. And again, I continued trying month after month. I, I spent, th you know, a fortune going to different naturopathic doctors, trying different cleanses and medicines and supplements, and nothing worked. At one point, um, they discovered I had a parasitic infection. And I took, me and my wife both took, just so, so there was no cross-contamination, um, enough anti-natural and pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical grade anti-parasitic that could kill an elephant. I mean, I took months of this stuff and it didn't move the needle that much. I mean, I was maybe 20% better. So I, I said, you know, I've tried it all. And I, I, you know, in not being able to sleep, you stay up at night, you start doing research. And that at some point in that probably two and a half year journey, um, I miraculously ran into, as many people have, the Michaela Peterson story. And I said, well... What are the chances, you know, she had rheumatoid arthritis or something? I don't have that. I have IC, interstitial cystitis, which was the diagnosis I was always given, which is, by the way, they tell you there's no cure for it. You just have to live with it. That that That's the heartbreaking part when they, you know, most urologists tell, well, you, well, if they even give you a diagnosis of IC and not a sports hernia or whatever they want to just pick out of the cabinet, um, they tell there's no cure. And I said, wow, if this is my life from now on in my mid 30s, this is going to be terrible. This is, you know, I can't live my life like this. It was miserable. I was in pain. I was suffering. I couldn't sleep. I was depressed. And I just didn't understand how could there be no answers. So then I saw her story and I searched up, okay, interstitial cystitis and carnivore diet. And luckily there was two or three people. There's not many people that talk about it in the carnivore space about how it cures urinary um, bladder issues and irritation and cystitis and things like that. I said, let me try. What's the worst that could happen? You know, let me try. And then when I tried it, within two weeks, 80% of my symptoms were gone. And I was just like <laughs> blown away. And I just didn't get it. You know, I didn't understand. And I was, you know, in a way, I was a little bit fortunate that I didn't think the diet was so crazy. I was willing to do it because I've been fortunate in my life to travel and I've been to places where there are still traditional peoples. I, I, you know, when I was a young, in my late teens, I spent time with the Maasai and Maasai Mara in Kenya with my father. And I saw how they're basically carnivore. And I saw, uh, I've been to uh, parts of Australia where I've encountered real Aboriginal peoples and I see what they're supposed to eat and what happens when they don't eat that way. And I also have native friends here in Oklahoma and South uh, South Dakota that I've seen what happens when they go back to a traditional diet. And I had read some of even people like, you know, George Catlin, who was kind of a, one of the first explorers 
who kind of chronicled a lot of native cultures here in, in the US and he was kind of very ad, ad, adept at so, noticing they basically ate venison and buffalo in, in many instances and they were perfectly healthy. And so I, I put all that together, I said, well, you know, obviously there's the Inuit Eskimo that people know about. And I said, okay, I know about these peoples, let me try it. And again, I was basically very, very surprised that in, within two weeks, it didn't take months, it didn't take, you know, extended a period of my time. Within two weeks, I was 80% better and I could live my life again. I wasn't a hundred percent, but I could now I could work again. I could sleep again. I started urinating at a normal frequency every three to five hours. It, you know, it wasn't like before where I was like, when I was at my worst, it was literally every 30 minutes, every 45 minutes to an hour, I was urinating, urinating, and I, and I couldn't live life. And waking up, if you can even sleep 10 hours a night, I mean, 10 times a night, it was, it was a hell. And, you know, it, it, and on top of you add that, of course, it's going to stress you to some degree that the the depression and, and just feeling weak, you know, and I, I was never used to feeling that way. So then I, because I got results in a way so fast, I said, OK, now I, I want to know why the why of why this is working. And that's when I started, you know, digging into the podcast and digging into li literature and digging a little deeper and you know of course you come across the works of you know dr natasha Campbell mcbride with the gaps diet and explaining how plant matter is indigestible basically and and your body will just sit there and ferment it and again looking back i was eating a lot of this stuff and i, I was doing the healthy thing you know i, I and again it, it, i was never a guy to eat you know pizza hutter and, and things like that i was always i i had cut out sugars in the past completely but I was still eating a lot of fruit and a lot of vegetables and a lot of things. And to a certain degree, that was probably the catalyst that got me slowly, slowly, maybe oxalate, uh, you know, poisoned or something over time. And then you add things like, you know, um, before COVID, uh, you know, I got a, this is in 2019, mind you, I got a tetanus booster vaccine. That destroyed my immune system. I know that now. And that probably did make me susceptible to picking up a parasitic infection. So it was a it was a multiple tier thing. It wasn't just one thing. And you know, people always want to know what the straw that broke the camel's back was. It wasn't. It was years of eating a paleo, very you know, I was eating sweet potato, yucca, potatoes daily. I mean, all the the what you're told is healthy. Then you add a vaccine on top of that, and then you add, um, you know, a parasitic infection, which, I mean, I did see it. it that wasn't a, a lie, but that wasn't the full answer. You you compound these things one on top of the other, and it just breaks a, a breaking point. And I found now in talking to people, this tends to happen to a lot of people in their mid-30s. It's kind of like a breaking point of your body reaches a toxicity level, whether it be through years of poor diet that it just in your mid 30s you run out of essential nutrients or stores or something and you just your body hits a crash and that's happening to a lot of people in my generation is that in their mid 30s it's like a, you know and they just think it's part of getting older and it's not it's 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 part of this so of course you know um i mentioned dr natasha Campbell mcbride i read obviously um Weston A. Price, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration because i'd wanted to know more also the anthropological anthropological side of it and archaeological side of it and why this diet is really the most optimal human diet not the dogma we've been told or, or you know based on ansel keys fra you know bs stuff the real reason for it so i, I dug into the books and I, I started reading and reading and you know in that it kind of wakes you up to realizing how we're genetically built and again, this I, I studied film. Going into this science uh, nutritional space was new for me, but I kind of really enjoyed it because I said this this is really something to it. And then how I also noticed my wife's a trooper. She joined me at the beginning when I said, "Listen, I'm going to try this diet." She said, "Okay, let's do it." And she had done paleo with me, and you know, my wife never had any health issues. You know, knock on wood, she's always been healthy. And she said, I'm going to help you in this. You're suffering so much. I'm going to I'm going to do this with you. And how I know I had further confirmation this really worked is that even her with no autoimmune issues, no conditions, she felt significantly better. Her fatigue uh, that she had, which was the only kind of 
issue you, you might say she had gone energy uh, you know more vibrancy everything kind of so it worked on a healthy person like my wife and it worked on someone who's like you know almost deathly ill like me i said there, there has to be something here so you know it kind of wakes you up to realizing and observing things and and paying attention you know i i think uh something i tell people is for example people think they're eating a healthy diet uh, when they're having oats and a banana smoothie in the middle of winter in buffalo new york and i said that that would never you can never eat that way you can never source bananas in buffalo new york in the middle of winter to make this smorgasbord of of stuff it just people people you know they trying they're trying that's the thing they're, it's not people are being careless they're, people are trying they've just been told the wrong information and in that that's leading slowly it, it you know over time to to many issues and you know i tell people again i was fortunate enough to travel and see i mean people get this idea people say well how about didn't indigenous people also eat uh, you know vegetables and roots and stuff yeah, but there's a caveat to that and dr natasha explains that most of the time it was very limited and seasonal and if they did consume plant matter it was always fermented or in a way that mitigated a lot of these indigenous toxins so they knew from generations that you didn't just take a yucca out of the ground or a cassava out of the ground and eat it they knew they had to ferment it or do certain processes to eliminate those toxins soak it in the river over three days or, or you know something they they knew this and it was again seasonal and very you know sporadic it was the backup food not not only that these people were outside sweating moving you know for hours of the day we're inside artificial light all day barely moving sweating these it's to get these minimal sources of carbs they earned it people don't understand how hard it is to get a handful of berries out in nature you have to walk miles and miles and when they're gone they're gone and and that was the other thing you know people, well how about people living near the equator aren't they more likely to have all this plethora of, of fruits and veggies and i said you know i've been to Pucallpa, peru the real jungle and people have this hollywood myth of what a jungle really looks like where you're just picking you know bananas and and pears and stuff it's not like that at all finding fruit in the jungle is extremely hard animals birds and other apes are going to get to it way better faster than you and then if you do actually get it you're going to share it with the community so it's not like you're going to have a whole bushel of bananas by yourself you're going to share it with your, your tribe and then like i said before you're out there sweating all day in the sun burning off a lot of this stuff and that wasn't even the most prized thing you know you ask anyone what the most prized thing in all these ancient cultures it was meat so putting all that didn't make me feel so crazy in trying this and you know when still when i talk to people they think well you only eat red meat i said yeah i mean and, and initially it's worth noting i i did initially do more of a traditional carnivore with um, eggs and butter and i've come to find that more of a lion style approach is even better for me and when i do that consistently that's when i get really close to 100 percent. everything is you know amazing sleep uh bladder everything when i when i do that you know sometimes if i'm traveling for business or something and i have to have eggs or you know butter that i i don't know where it was sourced things will go back a little bit but not where i can't live my life you know so you have to find the people have to for themselves figure this part out you know how much what you should try to eliminate should you go full lion should you incorporate these things i mean I, I tell my wife i mean my wife can tolerate raw dairy that we get from an amish farm i think that's amazing if she tolerates it she feels great if you can tolerate eggs and dairy wonderful for me uh, and other people that are really sensitive it's, it's more iffy so um wow congratulations <laughs> um you. you know something that stands out for me from what you said is like waking up 10 times a night there's nothing worse if you cannot sleep there is nothing worse right it it, it was really a i mean i i've never experienced such a hell a hell it, it was it was awful i said if this is my life from now on I, I was in a really dark spot 
because I said, I don't understand. And no one could give me answers, you know, and, and you turn to conventional medicine and, and they didn't tell you anything. And they tried to give you sleeping pills. And I, I, I even tried those and didn't do anything. And it's because it's the inflammation from the brain that you, it's just triggering all this. And it, it gets to a really bad place because you start worrying more and more what's happening with me. Am I dying? You know, this and that. And then yet all the blood, I mean, I, I took out so many tubes of blood from endocrinologists every single urologist and it was oh everything's fine i'm like nothing is fine i'm dying over here and and they don't understand and they just think you're being you know crazy or something and it's 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 really frustrating and you know that's the part that um the more naturopathic uh side and and uh, functional medicine doctors were a little bit more empathetic em empathetic um they kind of understood the what you were going through but they didn't have all the answers still so I mean, I tried acupuncture. I tried everything you could imagine. It was it was crazy. And again, they moved the needle a little bit, but nothing that got me to. I kind of had to figure this out on my own. And and I, I I tell people about it now because that's the part that people sometimes when we go out or in business, people look at me. You're only eating that, and I said, yeah. But then they start, themselves start telling me about all these issues they have that they think. But then they say, well, I can't eat like that. I'm like, so you'd rather feel like crap, but you don't even want to try. No, no, I could never live without chocolate or something. I'm like, so it's kind of, you know, I, I try not to <laughs> sermonize people too much, or but it I just see it out there that a lot of people are suffering and they think that's normal or this is the new normal that they have to live with. And that's the one thing I just didn't give up. I said, this can't be my new normal. And I, I, I would stay up nights, nights after nights, just searching, searching, searching. I would look up. I mean, again, I studied film and all of a sudden I was reading medical papers and learning how to read medical papers and seeing how was it a valid study? Did they do it right? Is it just anecdotal? Is it, you know, double blind placebo? I never knew about any of this stuff. And I was forced to because I just, okay, I put interstitial societies, how to, how to fix this. And then you start looking up studies and there's theories and hormonals and all that, but it all ties in. I, I think in many cases to to nutrition and there were clues there, but you don't l realize the clues until after the fact. You know, one of the things I I realize even even now is it's almost like in my case, like a hyperinsulinemia response. It's almost like a super diabetes response. Any sort of carbs trigger me almost immediately. And when I look back, one of the things I would force myself to feel better is that even though I was just feeling terrible and my bladder was on fire, I would force myself to go on a vigorous run. And I would force myself to sweat and run and run. And I, that would kind of calm a flare. And now I'm realizing when you do this kind of vigorous uh, aerobic exercise, you're going through carb stores first. So my body was burning that up and now I was, I was feeling better. So clues were there. I just, you don't, you know, you don't realize it at the time. And, you know, obviously you look back, um, possibly I know oxalates, uh, this is, uh, you had her on Sally Norton, um, and, and the dangers of that. And, and looking back again, I was eating sweet potato almost every day. I was eating yucca almost every day. I was eating spinach salad almost every day. Uh, I was having some meat at the time, but you know, in paleo, it's more, you know, the, the rainbow of wonderful vegetables and grains and all this stuff. And, and I, you know, I, it probably that was a big contributor. And, um, that's the thing. I, I a lot of people, this kind of poor diet hits you in your Achilles heel. If it's skin is your weak issue, you will get psoriasis or, you know, some sort of eczema. If it's your joints, you'll get, a, you know, in my case, it's the bladder. That's kind of my weak point. Other people, it's the gut. Um, other people, it's brain issues. And, you know, there is a lot of now, luckily, research coming out that, in a way, um, mental health issues is basically a metabolic disease. And I just read um, Christopher Palmer's uh, Brain Energy book about how, basically, from mild, you know, mild depression all the way to schizophrenia, it's some form of metabolic disease. And, you know, we've been brainwashed to eat these healthy foods that are really just slowly killing us. And, mm. you know, 
So that's it's it, yeah, uh, like it really does seem everything that stems from metabolic conditions. When you think, look at all the other species out there. How often are they at the vet? Yeah. How often do you need to take your dog to the vet? How often do you need to take your cat to the vet? It, it, because it, they're not ingesting donuts and stuff. Exactly. You know? And that's that's something else I tell people is you look, again, back to observing nature. We've lost that ability. You know, we used to be so in touch with nature. But if you look at almost every other animal, they eat one or two specialized foods, whether it's a koala that eats eucalyptus or a panda that eats, you know, bamboo shoots or a lion. Yes, a lion might have a gazelle and a hippo or, you know, whatever, but it's meat. Every, almost every other species, even, you know, a whale eats krill, has one thing. But through, I guess, human arrogance, because we're so smart, we think we can bypass that and have a hundred ingredients, you know, we, we, with each thing. And I tell people that is a bored French King's thing to be different to, I'm going to have a plate of food with a hundred different ingredients. Cause I can, the peasants are going to have just the one I'm going to have a, a red wine reduction with all this stuff. It's, it's like, no, no one was, you know, it's silly. You look at nature, all, all animals eat a specific food, you know, even the most diverse like bears that eat some berries, you know, they're still mainly carnivorous and they're adapted to that. But we, We've lost that ability. And again, I, I, for example, in, in relating to observing nature, me and my wife now have gone, you know, we travel a, a lot and we go sometimes, we've gone two years now to the Greek Isles. If you go to the Greek Isles and you actually observe what could physically and realistically you could eat from this environment, it's ocean, very arid, desert-like environment with small little shrubs and, you know, so... In reality, you can only have seafood, a lot of it, maybe some goats and sheep and milk and maybe some small hardy olive trees. And that's about it. And that you go to the grocery store nowadays and there's every fruit from <laughs> that you could ever imagine. There's this plethora of vegetables that could never realistically grow there. And people don't stop to say, wait a minute, I'm in this place now. I should eat what should be available. They, they just doesn't make sense. You go to a grocery store, well, I'm going to have a banana. But a banana would never grow in the Greek Isles. It's just out of place. And, and people don't stop to pay attention to these things. Same as in the animal world, as you're saying. Why don't animals get cancer or diabetes or obesity? Because they know what to eat. They, and they instinctively do that. I mean, and part of the, the animal thing, if the, the partner of, um, of the Weston A. Price Foundation is the Pottinger, the Pottinger cat study. I don't know if you've heard about that, where um, he he gave, uh, this is back in like the 50s or 60s, he gave um, cooked meat and um, pasteurized milk to cats. And over three generations, they were completely malformed. A lot of their motor skills were gone. Their facial structure completely changed just from that because cats are designed to eat raw meat and, and raw milk and just that small change. And that's not even doing the conventional pebbles that people give them now, or it completely changed their morphology in just three generations and their face structure changed everything that they, they would drop them from a certain height. They couldn't land on their feet. And that's a famous study that showed just how quickly nutrition within one or two generations changes us completely. And I mean, now in the U.S., it's 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 an epidemic, and it's really it's really hard to avoid it. And you know, socially, it's very hard. I mean, I we have to eat most of our foods at home now because you can't trust what a restaurant has, or not only are you paying a lot, but the ingredients are, are crap. So yeah. it's it's a challenging thing. The only part I will say is challenging is the social aspect, but you know, you you can make it work. You know, <laughs> I've been to business meetings where. People, you're just having a steak? I'm like, yeah. You don't want any sides? No, I don't want any sides. Are you sure? No, yes. And it just, you know, only salt. Give me only salt. I don't want pepper. I don't want any fancy stuff on it. No Worcester sauce or anything. And it's, you'll get the looks, but, the, you know, you realize. I, I'm kind of proud of those looks now. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm different. I don't care. I feel better than you do. So I'm That's happy. the thing. And, I, I, you know, sometimes you don't want to be rude because a lot of people looking at you a little funny. You can just tell 
they're unhealthy. Either they're massively obese or ha you can just tell they have some sort of metabolic issue. And it's like, you're questioning me. Okay. I mean, I, but you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be, you know, pompous or ar arrogant or something, but it's like, come on, you know? Oh, but you don't drink. You, you don't even have a drink. I don't drink, you know, it's, uh, it's tricky. So. Yeah. So your, your wife has, uh, has stayed with this as well because she's feeling so much better too. You know, it's interesting that she, she, we've been doing it now since February of 2022. So it's been over, yeah, like two, two years and three months. So it's been, it's been a while and it's funny because you know, it's good for us. Now she just got pregnant and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and she notices at first, the only thing is she had some meat aversion at the beginning. And when she cut out meat, she, I mean, she switched to chicken and fish. She felt the difference rapidly. She's like, you know, when I have chicken or fish on a daily, her energy is a little bit more sluggish or whatever. But when she, you know, she can tolerate some sauces and stuff. Now, when she's having red meat with a little bit of sauce or something to kind of mask it, immediately it feels like her brain is just lighting up. Or she'll make a tartare at home with two good raw eggs and then, you know, clean everything so it's safe. And when she has a steak tartare, it, she, she says it's literally like putting jet fuel in her, in her, in her veins. It, she, she notices. And, of course, you know, yes, they tell you, you know, well, chicken and fish is still protein and you're still... Yes, but it's missing a lot of the, you know, essential amino uh, fatty acids and stuff that really give you that brain energy and, and stuff, you know. Again, that goes back to the the psychological side of it. I mean, most people don't realize like 2% of your body's weight is your brain, but it uses about 25% of the energy and about 70 to 75% of it is cholesterol, is fat. And we've been told, oh, no, stay away from cholesterol. Cholesterol is bad. But your brain is basically the fattiest, most nutrient-dense organ you, you have. And if you starve it, eating, you know, healthy, you know, chicken every day, you're not getting what you really need, the essential building blocks you need to, to repair and, and build. And so she, back to your question, yes, she's been doing it with me since February of 2022. And um now she's starting to incorporate through her pregnancy and as she's halfway now um meet again and she just she can tell the difference and a lot of her eggs again she she's lucky where she can really tolerate um good eggs and um dairy and she feels amazing on it so yeah she, she's not going back and we plan on our child kind of following in our steps and eating this way you know ancestrally appropriate none of these cheerios or this crap that you know we've been told is is <laughs> Wow. Well, congratulations. Oh, that, that's, that's wonderful news. Thank you. Um, so um, one, one thing just on that point, one thing I'm interested in is like, it, has your wife been suffering morning sickness and things like that? That's actually, you know, we have friends that are, uh, uh, one of her friends is also pregnant a little bit um, um, before and she's had one day of sickness at the beginning and that's it knock on wood she says she credits that to the diet that you know she's eating basically yes carnivore with more chicken and fish but zero carbs she has very very little carbs i think the only carbs she gets are from the lactase and lactose and and, and the dairy that the raw dairy she has yogurt and kefir and and things like that and and she'll have raw milk and that's probably the only significant source of carbs. Once in a while, she might get some, a little bit of honey and put on cottage cheese or something, but that's pretty much the only carbs. And she says she herself attributes that to, first of all, she hasn't gained 40 pounds or anything. She's stayed pretty, you know, I think only gained like 10 or 12 pounds this whole time. And she just feels good. And, you know, she doesn't feel exhausted and, and she hasn't had that dreaded morning sickness. She had literally one night of that at towards the beginning. And that's it. So it's, you know, she's read a lot of book, uh, a lot of books about it as well. Uh, one was called uh, Nourishing Traditions um, about certain uh, what moms need to really build a nourishing environment for themselves and the baby, because you're building a whole new human and you need a lot of these essential 
uh, nutrients and, and, you know, vitamins that we, you know, have <laughs> been demonized. And, and that goes, ties into something that one of the, we, when I was really doing the naturopathic route, I was taking 40 pills a day of all these supplements. We barely supplement with anything now. And that's something that is worth mentioning because it's not a fault of the carnivore diet in, in itself is that we need to supplement with certain trace minerals that were in our water supply and in our soils. So even if you're getting the best grass fed beef, the soil is not the same. So that's the only thing we really supplement. We supplement very sparingly, very little things. And it's mainly magnesium, iodine, um, boron in my case, and uh, lithium orate. And um, that's the second thing worth mentioning is that the second biggest factor that changed my health around was iodine supplementation. And that was after I reading two books, one by Sally Norton and another one by Dr. Brownstein about how iodine is really essential for optimal health. And we're, most people are, if, if, you know, just completely deficient because of our water and because of, you know, we used to have, people don't realize we used to get our water from rivers and streams and deep water wells that were just full of, you know, rock erosion and minerals. And now we get chlorine and fluoride in our water. You know, it's not, we, we got the shorter than the stick. So we have to kind of supplement with these things. So those are the only things. If you're eating enough steak and eggs, you're going to be pretty much filling what you need. But then you do still, in my opinion, um, need to have some minerals in there to, to fill it in. And electrolyte balances, you know, I have electrolytes as well. That's it. Uh, we have very few. Aside from those I mentioned, the only other thing is vitamin D. And that's it. We, you know, so she's, she's noticed that when she supplements these things, she feels even better. Um, so, so the minerals are a big thing. And, um, you know, I, I think she takes, um, when she started, when she knew she was pregnant, um, cod liver oil. So that's something she takes daily as well to get, you know, that's new, super nutrient dense as well. So, yeah. Nice. Um, so how uh, many times are you eating during the day? I eat twice a day. Um, and so does my wife. We eat just twice a day. I skip breakfast and I'll have an electrolyte water uh, upon waking. And then I'll just go straight into a late lunch and then I'll have dinner. And it's, again, I'll experiment little things here and there. You know, I've tried a little bit of raw dairy here and there. But again, like I mentioned, I do best on a kind of lion diet. So I'll do about a pound and a half of meat for lunch and then a pound or a pound and a half of meat for dinner. And that's about it. That's twice a day. And, you know, I've, I've leaned out, but I don't feel emaciated or, or weak or anything. I'm, I'm stronger at the gym than ever. I, I feel good. Um, and... I just eat to kind of satisfaction and plenty of fatty meat and, and salt. I put a lot of salt. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the salt. Yeah. These days. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I sprinkle that liberally and on top of the electrolyte, you know, uh, drinks that are very, have a lot of sodium. And I, I think people that that's another thing people don't, realize another thing that's been demonized is oh stay away from salt so i measure my um, when i go to the you know to measure my blood pressure every time it's like 98 over 60 or something and i put <laughs> a lot of salt in my food and people are you know salt is so essential it's so good for you it, it's you know it, almost every cell in the body has a sodium chloride receptor you need salt I mean, people don't realize that the word salary used to come from how Roman soldiers were paid. That's how valuable it was. It's, you know, <laughs> the salary is they were paid in salt. And it's it's so essential. And, you know, I eat all the salt in one and my blood pressure is never. Th oh, your isn't your blood pressure through the room? I said, no, come look at it. 98 over 58 or something like that. Most of the time, it barely goes over 100 and I'm fine. And, you know, and you just kind of have to. I've been. People ask me, oh, don't you get gout? I said, listen, I can go to a Brazilian steakhouse and have three pounds of meat and I'll be fine. Now, if I were to go to the same Brazilian steakhouse, I have three pounds of meat, 
plus some plantains and some rice and a whiskey and a wine and a tiramisu at the end, then you're going to get your gout. Of course, because those are combinations that were, you know, your body just can't handle. And, and you're mixing, it's not, you, there are people blaming it on the protein for gout. It's not the protein, it's all these other things that are causing the inflammation and on top of the, the protein. So you will never get gout fr from just eating meat. It's, I mean, why, uh, through human evolution, why would that ever, you know, happen? But of course, now we're eating all these other things on top of it. Oh, no, it's the meat. That's no, not the meat. Stop eating the tiramisu and the wine and the, you know, the, the bowl of rice and you're not going to get gout. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty, yeah. It, it's really sad how um, the, basically the marketing messages have reduced information down so much and taken, removed all the context so that we just, we hear these things, oh, meat, gout, things like that, right? Meat, gout, or, or, or heart disease. I mean, that was another thing. Um, when I started this diet, luckily I had a, a functional medicine uh, not, a practitioner who was looking after me who was luckily with the data. And I would literally, which is what I tell people to do, bring papers to them and say, well, how about this? Because people, doctors think they're infallible and, and they can't be questioned. And a lot of times it's not that they're evil or anything. They're just not up to date with the data. They're never given nutritional data. So you have to bring papers, study medical papers with them say, how about this? So in my case, when I started the diet, after I did like, after 11 months of doing the diet, I did my blood work. And of course my LDL was sky high. And she, my doctor was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I mean, I know what you're doing and you're feeling good. So I'm not going to tell you to stop, but. So then I brought her a bunch of papers on lean mass hyper responders and, uh, and she's like, okay, well, just to be safe, let's do, and I tell this to everyone that's afraid of cholesterol, go do a CAC score, go do a calcium cardiac score, you know, and this in, in us, it's $99 out of pocket. Of, of course, insurance is not, not going to cover it. They want you to go by the blood work, not by the CT scan. And when I went in, you know, brr, 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 the whole thing, I have zero. But my LDL is at like 360 or something. It's I'm like a true lean mass hyper responder. I'm like, my LDL is crazy high. Um, and I had zero, zero plaque. And I tell people, okay, so what's this? What's the worry? What's this? What, what's going to happen? Go do a CAC score. See where you're at. And if there is any damage, it's probably not from eating the meat. It's from smoking or drinking or whatever years of that you know that you can maybe hopefully reverse to some degree but it's not not because of the meat and and so i showed her i said look you want me to do this easy zero what are you going to tell me now she's like well no fine keep doing it <laughs> so yeah so i guess from this point it's like you know you kind of all the way right or lying yeah. all the way yeah you know i i I've tried to incorporate a little thing, not not so much because I need it, but just to have a little bit more freedom when I'm traveling or something. And at least in my case, I think I met, I heard your story when you tried to incorporate a bit of bok choy, you immediately started kind of, that's how I am. You know, I've tried even simple things like eggs or cucumber or whatever. And I immediately start feeling it. not maybe not day one, but by, you know, day three, things start going a little haywire. And I know, OK, not, no, I'm not ready for it. I can't do it. You know, um, one thing I have tried occasionally and I seem to be OK with it, but very limited amounts is a little bit of honey, raw honey. And I don't do it very often, but once every little bit but I tested it for three days and it didn't seem to flare me up is um, overnight soaked rice, white rice. So soaking it overnight, rinsing it repeatedly to all that white stuff is gone. And then soaking it overnight, white rice straight out of the bag. I, I feel like crap, but doing that overnight soaking, which again, talks to traditional practices that most Asian cultures knew. And most people knew that depending on rice was you over always soaked it that I seem to be okay. But, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm just um, a lot of salt, a lot of red, red meat, 
Um, that's another thing you ask whether, uh, you know, people ask me, how about fish and, and, and uh, chicken? You don't have that? I mentioned, you know, Greece with my wife. If I go to Greece with my my wife and you go to a restaurant and I say, you know, you want the fish of the day? And I, you say, I say, yeah, come pick it in the back. They literally open up the freezer and they say, this were fish this morning. Which one do you want? With the head and everything. It's not some mystery filet. I'll have fish then, you know? Okay, because I know what I'm getting. It was caught that morning. It's, you know, and you when they present it to you, you're getting the whole thing. So I'll have fish in those occasions. But... 99.9% of the time, it's red fatty meat. And, um, you know, I'll have mainly uh, beef, bison, lamb occasionally, but r red fatty meat. I mean, skirt steak, ribeye, uh, ground beef, 80 20. Um, and I'll use tallow. Uh, I, I, you know, these are little things you have to tweak over time. Again, I, when I first started, I was using ghee and butter to cook my foods. Now I switch to mainly tallow, and I feel even better. You know, uh, so it's it's a you, people have to experiment with what their tolerance level is. But yeah, for me, I mean, I wish I could have you know a bunch of cheese and a burger and just that. But so, sometimes cheese doesn't agree with. So yeah, back to back to the mainly it's it's mainly just beef, water, salt. What advice would you give to someone if uh, they wanted to get started and you you want them to have the best chance possible of uh, seeing it through? You know, you, you have to do this. Eat it first. Cook at home. Don't worry so much. People ask me, isn't this expensive? I say it can be if you're getting grass fed organic. The most, But any meat is better than no meat. So whatever your budget allows Stick to as much red meat as possible. And I tell people this all the time. Give yourself 30 days. 30 days. If at the end of the 30 days you haven't noticed even a 50% improvement, then you're an anomaly and I don't know. But <laughs> but give yourself 30 days to do this and be strict. I mean, be, you can't be a weekend warrior where you know, you know eat good Monday through Friday and then the weekend comes around and you go have a case of beer and, and a pizza. That's not going to work because a lot of these things stay in your body for an extended period of time and it really takes a long time to flush them out so eat as much home cooked meals as possible purchase within your budget and don't forget the electrolytes and, and certain minerals that i think it's again no fault of the carnivore diet it's just certain other things like our water supply that is just you need to supplement with these things to have the best chance of feeling the best. Are, if you don't, if you ignore the the the, the minerals, are you still going to feel better? Yes. You want to feel even better. You need to add these. Um, you know, sodium, um, iodine. I think is again for me is one of the biggest ones. Um, magnesium and certain other trace minerals that we're not getting. So get yourself some really really good salt, some good Celtic sea salt or or some good Redmond's re, uh, real salt, a good mineral profile salt, salt liberally hydrate and you know don't be tempted i mean that's the part i think most people they think this is you're going to be excluded now you know you're going to get invited to a wedding you're going to get invited to a birthday what are you going to do no you can work around it just order a steak and that's it you know and if people look at you weird then just look at them and and are are they really thriving you know you have to you 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 have to question these things and and just what feels good you have to people need to switch from the mindset that food is entertainment and a diversion to food is fuel people now associate food with some sort of um i don't know it, it's like a an activity i say there's so many other things to do you don't have to associate food with some sort of feel good thing it, it, yes food can be good but it was never meant as that way you know it was always as nourishment to keep you healthy and strong and, and thriving. And, you know, I, I see it time and time in books. I mean, I, that's what I always I tell people, look back through history, try to do a little bit of unbiased, just history. And you see time and time again, this is what people ate. And, and you, you know, you, you read about George Callan wrote about the Comanches and how they were the fiercest warrior nation. 95% of their diet was buffalo. That was it. And they kept Western expansion at bay for 
so many years because no one wanted to mess with them. These guys were strong. They were powerful. They were connected with nature. They were spiritual people. And they that was 95% of that was Buffalo. And, you know, you look at Native people now it, it, and us, you know, what's happening to us. It's, 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 you got to use your common sense and just think. And I think that one guy ta that talks about a lot of common sense, you, you do too, but is a guy like Dr. Ken Berry and looking at a proper human diet and just think <laughs> what were people doing for thousands of hundreds of thousands of years? We didn't have Cheerios. You know, I, I tell people about, and maybe it's kind of a funny story about, do people know the story of, oh, uh, frosted flakes and, and corn flakes, a part of a, a complete diet? You know, John Harvey Kellogg was a quack who used to work at a mental hospital who realized when his patients and patients in the mental ward were had eggs and meat and stuff, they got really ramped up and they got rambunctious and they attacked the nurses. So he came up with Kellogg's cornflakes to dampen and keep them kind of chemically castrated, basically. And that's what people thought for all these, oh, you know, have your cereal. It's so healthy. But people don't realize John Harvey Kellogg made this cereal to dampen mental patients' hormones. So you just have to think that, look back. So that's that's my advice is look back to people that thrive for millennia, thrive for generations. You look at any cave painting in the world, they're hunting animals. <laughs> you know, they're not... They're not, they're not <laughs> hunting Cheerios or cornflakes. <laughs> yeah, of cornflakes. You know, they're hunting huge wild game. And that's, that's what kept us you know, thriving for all these years. Look at nature. Observe your nature. If you're in Buffalo and you're in, in, in winter, I mean, I had this lady talk to me one day. Well, I live in, in Montreal, Canada, and I have uh, two smoothies every day. I'm like, of course you're not feeling better because you're in the middle of the cold in winter. You're having all these banana smoothies. That's not going to make sense for you or anybody, you know. And and so just think what makes sense and, and look back and s separate the the mainstream media the dogma the things we've been told are healthy for us and in fact they're slowly killing us and and the numbers are there to show the obesity rates depression rates are all skyrocketing um are, are there environmental factors you can also clean up you know filtered water try to sauna things like that try not to use a bunch of detergents and stuff yeah those are cherries on the top but i think the foundation is your, your nutrition and your your daily diet what you put in your mouth every day yes if you're still using a toxic shampoo or you know whatever that's not going to be the best but that's not going to really throw you overboard it's it's what you put in your mouth every day that's that's going to be the biggest factor so well said um so jose do you have any way people can reach out to you any social media man i'm old school i uh i, I haven't had social media but if anyone watches the video and they have a question or they want to contact me, they can write a comment. And my wife does have a, a YouTube account and we can communicate uh, through them. It's uh, her account is I married a film snob. So if uh, they, they see any communication from that, that's so they can write a comment and we can DM them or whatever. Um, if they have questions, especially for people, because that's one of the main reasons I wanted to come on here is that a lot of people talk about skin issues and gut issues and weight loss and mental health. But in my case, I wanted to mention the, the interstitial cystitis, the bladder issues, which the data has proven there's a lot of correlation. And uh, especially, I mean, it's more common actually in women than men, but bladder issues and how the gut access connection, it, it crosses through there. And it's, 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 don't be ignorant to think it's not related. It absolutely is. And you can get your life back. I know people with the IC um, diagnosis, it's heartbreaking. And it's one of the worst, one of the highest rates of depression is associated with that that does disease and that uh, diagnosis because it's just, it's a miserable. I mean, some people are urinating 50 times a day and it's just, it's because it's your body trying to purge. That's, that's the thing people don't realize. It's some, you, in, you ingested something, your body's saying, get it out, get it out, get it out. Some people do it through, you know, diarrhea, chronic diarrhea or whatever. And people with IC and more bladder sensitivity, it's your body trying to just flush this stuff out. And you're just peeing, peeing, peeing because that's what it's trying. It's the defense mechanism. 
So if anyone has any questions about that specifically related to IC, yes, I'd be happy to contact them or, or connect with them through the comments or whatever. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm very happy to hear you're doing so much better and uh, congratulations on, thank you. Uh, on the pregnancy. <laughs> thank you so much. I pre appreciate the time for uh, letting me come on here. It means a lot.